The following documentary is for entertainment purposes only and should not be counted as factual evidence. I encourage everyone to do their own research and make up their own minds when approaching anything which isn't scientifically proven. Alright guys, so hear me out. You're the manager at the St James Theatre in Wellington. It's after 12am on a weekday and you've just finished your nightly paperwork. It's just you and two security guards left. Everyone else is packed up and gone home for the night. Just before you make your final check on the auditorium, you pop out the fire exit for your last cigarette break, when suddenly you hear a loud bang followed by a series of smaller bangs. For a moment you're paralysed, fear and panic starts to kick in. You quickly drop your cigarette and head back into the auditorium to investigate. That's when you see it. A row of seats has been pushed down, from the left to the right. Someone push down and reset every seat in the row. You call the security guards to investigate, but there's no one there. So that's just one of the many chilling stories from the St. John's. But before we talk about the ghosts, we need to learn more about the fascinating history and find out what might be residing at the old theatre and why. The iconic St. James has a rich, rich backstory. In 1879, it was home of the old United Methodist Free Church and graveyard. In 1896, it was taken over by the Grand Templar Lodge and renamed the Coral Hall. It was also used as a refuge space for the Helping Hand mission. In 1893, professional tenor John Fuller arrived in New Zealand. He'd spent the last five years touring throughout Australia as part of the London Pavilion Company. He decided after his current New Zealand tour he'd migrate here permanently. After his commitments, he moved to Auckland with his family and quickly established himself in the entertainment and promotions business. In 1896, he formed the Fuller's Myorama Company and took his production on the road. The production featured coloured magic lantern pictures projected onto a screen with spoken commentary, along with music performed by Fuller and his family. He later replaced the Myorama Company with the Melbourne Wax Works and Vaudeville Company, a show ahead of its time, which featured wax figures of famous people in the foyer to greet his guests before they were treated to a musical show with accompanying slides. This kind of entertainment had not been seen before and had crowds clamouring for seats. He soon became a household name in New Zealand and was known as one of the pioneers to identify the potential of moving pictures. Because of this forward thinking, he began buying buildings around the country and converting them into theatres to showcase his new vision. In 1899, John purchased the old church hall in Courtney Place and began renovating it. In 1903, renovations completed and he renamed his new building His Majesty's Theatre, though most called it Fuller's. That grand opening would be short-lived, however, as the building faced even more repair work, and after three more weeks of repairs, the theatre reopened and began featuring silent movies with live music. On the 27th of December 1908, authorities found the body of a Liverpool seaman in the side alley cloakroom of His Majesty's Theatre. The room was used to store coats and umbrellas before the show. Behind the cloakroom was a urinal, which was also used as a frequent site for street prostitution. The cloakroom was located down the alleyway which now separates the St James with the infamous Mermaid Bar. Police say the manner in which J.H. McCormack was found was extremely bizarre as he had been garroted. Police say that he had a grotesque smile on his face and he was still clutching his erection. McCormack's killer was never found and although police had their suspicions, no one was ever convicted for the crime. By 1911, the hall had fallen into disrepair and was deemed a fire hazard, so the old hall was demolished. But John Fuller was a dreamer. He had dreams to build the biggest and best theatre New Zealand had ever seen. But there was only one man for the job, a young Dunedin architect by the name of Henry Eli White. Henry had built quite the reputation building the King's Theatre in Auckland. He had also built theatres in Timaru, Hastings, Blenheim and Whanganui. In 1900, John hired the 23-year-old to design a Christchurch theatre for him. After the work was complete, John was so impressed that he commissioned White to design another theatre, but this one was to be the biggest and best theatre in New Zealand. Construction began in March 1912 and was completed nine months later with a cost of £32,000, about $4 million in today's inflated market. A tribute to how well she was built, the old girl survived for many years before needing to be earthquake strengthened in the late 2010s. 
Brand new His Majesty Theatre was officially opened at 8pm on the 26th of December 1912 by the Mayor of Wellington, David McLaurin. The very first production was a romantic comedy silent film, Sweet Now of Old Durry. Over the next few years, the theatre would house many international acts, live shows, musical acts and silent picture shows with the orchestra pit playing the accompanying music. By the late 20s, talking picture shows had become more popular. John Fuller knew that he had to rewire the theatre for sound and on Saturday the 8th of February 1930, Fuller's general manager announced that they would be introducing talking pictures as a regular fare, leaving behind the days of silent movies. Punters poured in and accepted the new format immediately and on the 3rd of May 1930, without any warning, John Fuller's His Majesty Theatre changed its name to the St James Theatre where it would stay for good. It had survived many years and persevered through the changing times. She continued screening throughout the war, but it wouldn't stay in the fullest position for much longer. In March of 1945, Sir Robert Courage bought the St James along with 61 theatres in the fuller chain, expanding his empire to 131 cinemas. During the next few decades, the St James would flirt with the idea of bringing back its live shows. And during the 50s and 60s, with the help of Harry Wren, the St James shows would become bigger and better than ever. But by the 1970s, however, she started fading into cinematic obscurity. Touring shows stopped attending because of the rising costs, or they went to other venues like the Michael Fowler Centre, the State Opera House, or the newly revived Town Hall. Slowly but surely, the old girl slumped into a downwards decline. I mean... You could blame television for eating into audience numbers, along with more movies screening at smaller, newer venues. Soon whole levels of the theatre would be closed off and the upper levels would become a haunt from older times. And on the 7th of May 1987, she played her last picture show for only 100 patrons, marking the end of the Courage ownership. The Chase Corporation quickly swooped in and purchased the building. They wanted the theatre dead and buried so they could begin redeveloping on the prime Courtney Place location. But at the same time, a hero photographer by the name of Grant Sheehan was commissioned to photograph the inside of the iconic theatre and with his help, he raised awareness of the magnificent architecture and prompted a new classification to the building, meaning it was merited permanent preservation for its architectural significance. But this didn't completely protect it from its owners or the wrecking ball. Sheehan formed a preservation group and they would meet up periodically. And with the help of journalist Nicholas Saker, theatre technician Peter Freider, singer Anne Pacey, arts administrator David Hayams, architect Robert Ansell, theatre historian Peter Harcourt and theatre manager Gillian Manalos, they would lobby to the council and historical trust and speak to anyone who may help secure the preservation of the historic site. The Wellington Council made a trade-off of the Chase Corporation, allowing them to build a high-rise tower in Willow Street without any height restrictions, in return for the preservation of the St James. This was accepted as the only realistic way to save the old lady from demolition. Though this agreement seemed done and dusted, it would not last, as tensions between the City Council, the Save the St James Group and the Chase Corporation heated to a boiling point. The theatre was now back on the demolition schedule. But no one could foresee the upcoming events and the economic crash of 1987 took place and collapsed the Chase Corporation's plans and just about every other development around the world. The St James was back in limbo land. In July 1989, all of the Chase's properties came on the market with the St James asking price of $7 million, double what they originally paid for it. In 1995, after years of campaigning, the Save the St James group announced that they had acquired the building and had plans on spending $18.5 million on redeveloping the building and incorporating an adjacent building to become the home of the New Zealand Ballet Company. And on a November morning in 1997, my mum and a select few were granted access to the nearly finished site. Roger Shan, project director, led the tour. It took over $21 million and about a year to restore it, almost as long as it took to build her in the first place. He assured everyone that the doors would be open for its gala night on February 1998. Everything had been done to keep Henry White's original vision intact, but now they incorporated two extra buildings beside and behind, now married to the original structure. New foyer was built, new function areas, bars, cafe, as well as a rehearsal studio for the ballet, new lights and a sound system were all installed 
with a new power grid and new outlets along with major repairs done to the roof and new floors to prevent it from flooding. The St. James was back, although it was not for long. The Kaikoura earthquake kind of put a spanner in the works and it was clear that this old girl needed some extra support. The theatre closed once again in 2018 for earthquake strengthening and she reopened in June 2022, where it remains fully functional today. Okay, so now we're all caught up with the history, let's talk about the ghosts. Ghost encounters in theatres are nothing new. I'm pretty sure every theatre around the world has a resident ghost. The St James is no different. Strange encounters have been reported since the early 1940s. Staff and guests have reported weird sightings at any time of the day or night. While sitting in their seats, patrons have felt a short, cold gust of wind on the back of their necks. Staff have reported incidences of lights bursting, sometimes unscrewing out of the sockets before their very eyes. Some have heard heavy footsteps, and some have even heard loud hammering. Sometimes the lights would turn off, or even scarier, it was once reported that one of the managers locked up for the night and began walking back to his car. When he looked back at the theatre, the lights turned on, forcing him to walk back into the theatre and turn them off again. Rows of seats used to bang up and down. There is even a report of police and police dogs being called onto the theatre to investigate the banging. When the dogs were led up into the gallery, they refused to enter, growling with their hackles up. The theatre is said to be the home of at least three ghosts with many more sightings reported throughout the years. The main of which is the ghost of Yuri, a Russian ballet dancer. His story is pretty tragic. Apparently he fell in love with a ballerina by the name of Dasha. Though his advances would not be reciprocated as Dasha had fallen in love with one of the theatre's electricians. One night while up working in the rigging above the stage, Yuri fell to his death to the orchestra pit below. There have been stories saying that his death was the cause of suicide, or maybe he was murdered by either the stagehand or Dasha. Yuri is also credited for saving a staff member's life not once, but twice. A previous employee was dressing the stage when suddenly the lights went out. Shambling forward in the dark, he was suddenly pushed out of the way by an unknown force and knocked backwards. He described the sensation as if he had been hit in the chest with a bag of frozen peas. When his eyes adjusted to the darkness, he realised if he had taken another step forward, he would have fallen into the orchestra pit below, sharing the same fate as Yuri. The second time was when he was on the stage with his wife and infant son fixing up set pieces, when suddenly a rogue beam from above came crashing down. A second before it hit, he recalls being pushed out of the way along with his wife and son. If it had not been for the intervention, they would have been crushed to death by the falling beam. He credits both of these encounters to Yuri protecting him and his family. The other ghost is the ghost of the Wailing Woman, a less than friendly ghost. She is apparently the spirit of a struggling local artist who had her heart set on making her big break during the 40s. Her dreams were shattered when she took a battering of harsh reviews, so much that she became incredibly depressed and the night after she slashed her wrists in her dressing room on the mezzanine floor. The Wailing Woman is said to be responsible for all the accidents and mishaps that happen during the rehearsals and the shows. A number of female performers have suffered from sprained ankles, broken legs, trips and falls, along with coming down with a sudden illness or a sore throat which renders them incapable of performing. But she has only been seen twice. Once by a cashier who witnessed a woman wearing a red dress and a cape walking past her. The cashier tried to follow the woman but she vanished without a trace. The second time, Jackie Chandler Mills reported that her ghost had been sighted during a flood in the basement. She and another relative had been working there one day when they witnessed a woman wading through the water and walking into another room down the corridor. They claimed once the water was drained, they checked every room thoroughly and the woman could not be found. The third ghost is said to be that of the old theatre manager, Stan Andrews, who died in the 1960s, although he didn't die on the premise. He was an older bloke who worked as a stage manager for years. He was quite frail when people knew he was coming due to his wheeze cough and his walking cane. His favourite spot was sitting in the seats in the gallery watching and waiting to give his two cents to his staff. Bill Wander and Jackie were setting up for a show and while they were on the stage they looked up to the gallery and they saw a man walking back and forth. Bill sent up two security guards each going a separate entrance. When they reached the top no one was there. This was said to be the ghost of Stan Andrews. 
There have been reports of a man lurking in the side alley and disappearing into thin air. These stories have been backed up by multiple staff from the gentleman's club next door. There have also been reports of a singing choir who have left sounds of angelic voices from the stage, with the stories of these voices being heard in the various parts of the auditorium, upper stalls and side rows. It is said to believe that these are the spirits of a boys choir whose last performance was at the St James during the Second World War. They were shipped back home the next day but their ship would never make it back home due to it either being sunk from bad weather or possibly bombed. The ghost stories are so famous that even Mr Feeble's director Peter Jackson has shared his own ghost story from the glorious venue. In the early 2000s what now host Carolyn Taylor Male model Michael Hallows, along with Puka Shell Necklace, Aficionado, Brad Hills, visited the site with their show Ghost Adventures. Here they encountered floating orbs, strange sounds, a faulty elevator, and took some pretty strange photographs. Why do you think theatres are so haunted? It's a worldwide phenomenon though, eh? Every theatre seems to have its resident spook, and I guess New Zealand is no different. No, you're right actually. The Opera House in the Hawke's Bay is apparently haunted. Yep. There's the Civic in Auckland as well. Yeah. Well, we're going to spend the night in one of the most ornate theatres in New Zealand. It has a whole cast and crew of sightings and spirits. The St James in Wellington. Just, you can feel its history and how old it is. It sort of creaks and moans around you. Whoa, whoa. I'm standing. I've got to be careful now because I'm right up in what they call the gods up in the third tier. Whoa, 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 whoa. What was that? Oh, it's starting to get a bit creepy here. I have no idea what that was. It sounded like oh someone was following up the stairs behind me. Something spooked you up there, and you were up in the area of Yuri, and that's the photo that you took when you were up there. I actually reduced the brightness and the, and the contrast to see what it was. Oh. Oh. Came out looking like that. Oh, yeah. Uh, that's like a floaty. I just find a, a really odd it's so sharp. phenomena. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a slim sort of. Well, ballet dancer. Yep. Do you think it's Yuri up there? Well, that's his little place. It is. Okay, guys, so this is the part of the video where we talk about what we really know and try to break down some of the facts. I have a vested interest in the story, I'm not going to lie. It's pretty close to home. Both my mum and my dad were the manager of the St James for a time, and I also have family who'd spent their whole teenage years working there. It's very much part of my history, so it was hard for me to remain biased when researching and presenting the story, so I tried to remain as neutral as possible. Okay, so let's talk about the roof. The roof was prone to house a lot of pigeons, with numerous staff complaining that most of their time was spent taking care of the pigeons, the leak, and the chairs. The pigeons with their whole hooing along with the shape and the perfect acoustics of the St James could account for a lot of the strange sounds. It was said that the design and the curves of the auditorium meant that even the tiniest of sounds or whispers could be heard from anywhere. The basement flooded. This was a major, major problem for staff and performers alike. This was due to being on old waterlogged land. The roof leaked above the stage. This could actually account for a lot of the electrical faults. The problem with water is that it will find a path through anything, even the tiniest of gaps, making finding lakes a very big problem, and with the size of the St James it would be nearly impossible to fix this problem without replacing the entire roof. This meant that there could have been any number of leaks seeping into any electrical joints or hitting electrical lines or outlets, even lights. 
So the seats were known to be faulty and would often break before and after the shows as recounted by the staff interviews. This could explain a lot of the seat banging stories that we've heard over time. And it's also been pointed out that staff were prone to exacerbate a story to scare each other and new staff members. So you can't really rely on the, the stories that have been said over time. No records of Yuri have ever been found, nor any recorded deaths. Some say he was an immigrant, some say he was part of the Russian ballet travelling through. But again, no records could be found of him. And then there's the story of his death, or the story of Dasha. Again, no records could be found. And what about the story of her lover? Some reported he was an electrician, or some said he was a knife thrower. So what is it? So The Wailing Woman's a pretty interesting tale, but again, it has no merit. Like all good stories, the details get changed with time. Some have said that she was a widower looking for a comeback, being booed off the stage. Some said that she killed herself nowhere near the theatre. Without any solid evidence, we can't confirm her true identity, and all we have is the few reported sightings. So I think a lot of the knocks and bangs can be explained. At a time, Wellington was still using electric buses connected via cables. Uh, now this caused a lot of vibrations, which could explain a lot of the strange noises heard of a night time. The story of J.H. McCormack is the strangest of all. He is the only recorded murder in the theatre. Even though his story is pretty odd, I still kind of think that he was just kind of getting himself off and strangled himself to death. There's been a lot of people doing this over time. You just look at the guy from In Excess. So I think that he was just ahead of his time and he was just getting his rocks off. Okay, so if I'm perfectly honest, I'd say that there's no ghost of Yuri or the Wailing Woman or even the choir or the ghost of Stan Andrews. I'd hazard a guess to say that it's probably the ghost of J.H. McCormack or even the ghost of John Fuller, the original owner. It could even be the architect. Because there's no evidence of Yuri or the Wailing Woman, I would go with the facts and say that it's more likely to be someone who was directly associated with the St. James. Whether you believe the stories or not, you can't deny that having them gives this theatre a sense of mystery and wonder. But even if the ghost stories are false, the stories of love, heartache, desperation and excitement are all real. And without the help of those great people who volunteered to save this iconic building, the St. James could have become a ghost, being demolished like many other great relics from forgotten times. Although I don't completely believe in ghosts or the stories of the witnesses, that provides me with great comfort knowing that someone might be looking out for this old girl. So I think that's worth keeping these spirits alive in our hearts to haunt the mighty theatre for many years to come. And maybe she might even be a place for my mum to go and visit with her friends. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this documentary and you want to see more videos like this, make sure you subscribe to my channel and leave a like and a comment on what New Zealand mysteries you'd like to see me cover. All these little things help and it just helps get the algorithm running and uh, promoting my videos. So cheers for watching guys. I'll see you in the next one. Eh?